Welcome. It has just gone 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Wednesday the 21st of February, and you are watching episode 123 of Regional Wrap. Regional Wrap, providing insight on the issues affecting regional Australia and giving a voice to regional residents. My name is Bill Bates, and joining me on this episode, how to identify a dam site, is geologist Don Ethery. Before the days of HEX, John was a recipient of the New South Wales Education Scholarship to the University of New South Wales, Sydney. He graduated with a Bachelor of Science with a double degree major in geology. He went on to gain his Diploma of Education. John has some 50 years experience as a geologist. geologist. In his early career, he worked in New South Wales, Queensland, Northern Territory and the PNG. He went on to work later in Indonesia, New Zealand, Republic of Guinea, Italy, Turkey, Spain, Greece, Portugal, Fiji, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, USA, China and Saudi Arabia. Now, they reckon there's some jobs that can t take you to all corners of the world, but geologist has to be one of the best ones. John has exploration experience in oil, gold, tin, tungsten, copper, nickel, diamonds, and uranium. His assessment work on various mineral projects has enabled a number of startups to successfully list, list on the ASX. John is credited with some 16 professional publications as, and has been instrumental in the discovery of numerous mineral deposits. John is currently a non-executive director of Nuco Group Limited. Welcome, John. Oh, thank you, Bill. Mm. Just touching on, on, on your bio completely, but uh, it, it's very interesting in regards to uh, you were born around excavation by the looks of it because uh, you were uh, your primary schooling uh, initially started on at near one of the dams uh, for the Snowy River uh, system. So can you tell us a bit about your childhood background and, and uh, being in that sort of environment? Yes, certainly, yeah. That, that um, my early life certainly had a, an influence on where I went later. And uh, uh, from the age of four through to nine, we, my my parents were country school teachers, and so we we moved every few years, and uh, and from four till nine, uh, we lived in Burrunjuk Dam, which was the first of the the major dams uh, it, that was built even before the Snowy River scheme started as uh, as as a scheme. Uh, it was built on the Murrumbidgee River. Um, we were there at a time when they were actually lifting the dam to increase the storage capacity. So got to mix with um, and listen to engineers and various people who were involved in dam building through those early years. And thankfully, my father was was uh, very keen on geography and and uh, I started at one teacher school um, with 20 kids and uh, by the time I was eight I was able to hand draw a Mercata projection of the of the earth's surface so I knew where Spitsbergen was by the time I was eight um, the, the, that had a huge influence on where I went later. And and we then moved from there to another little town down in the same area called Adelong, which was an historic gold mining town, which is where I learnt the difference between uh, pyrite and and gold from an old prospector. Um, we then moved from there out onto the the river in a plain out to a place called Darlington Point, where they were just building uh, the Collyamberley irrigation scheme, basically turning semi-desert into a 
in the beautiful uh, crops and pasture. Um, so so that that had a huge influence on on my later life. Mm. Well, guess, one of the things yeah. about what, all that what you talk about with the dams and the irrigation system, uh, those were in the days when you can actually get things done. So uh, the 50s and 60s were really big heydays for Australian infrastructure and engineering. Uh, it's somewhat being a bit choked off today. Yeah, yeah, totally different story today. All, all the hoops you have to jump through to get something going today is um, the the older generation. Uh, uh, our parents would uh, would shudder to think about it. it. It just things didn't happen that way back then. Mm. Yeah, it was interesting. Also, I mean, today we hear about you know everyone's got to go to university and stuff like it doesn't matter how dumb they are, but they still got to go go for it. Uh, a university education and get a bit of paper. Uh, I'm a little bit interested in regards to um, your winning a scholarship. At those sort of things in those days, there wasn't free at university or anything like that, but a lot of good people got the opportunity through the scholarship systems to get to university. And most of those people... Um, had good marks or had good attitude or aptitude as well and got through their courses rather than a lot of people these days they go to university and then halfway through they change to another stream. Can you give us a bit of an idea of what that scholarship scheme was like and how you managed to get a, a university position? Yeah, well, that, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, I can go back even further. Um, I won a bursary to go to to high school basically um uh, that paid my way through boarding school because there was no boarding schools where where we were living and uh, so so i had my entire high schooling paid for on the basis of, uh, of a bursary that i'd won um then went on to university um um you know those days you didn't even think about going to university i mean i had no concept of university uh, leading up to leaving school and and then it all hit me and and uh and i won a commonwealth scholarship as well um but uh the the, the commonwealth scholarship wouldn't have supported me living in Sydney, um, so I ended up taking a teacher's college scholarship and and uh, doing a science degree and uh, on the, on the uh, teacher's college scholarship, which supported me. I you know I lived a fairly Spartan sort of life, but um, except except for the booze that was, but uh, <laughs> the, the, I mean you get. One has, to have, one has to have priorities in life yeah. when you're that That's old. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so I ended up in Sydney, um, having had little experience of it before, and, uh, uh, and flatting in hovels around the inner city. <laughs> yeah. It, but it was all good fun. I grew up yeah. amazingly. Mm. The other thing is... So with the the diploma of education sort of thing, you could have went off into a teaching role type of thing. So what made you sort of decide to go on to a field a life in the field as a geologist versus um, just teaching um, geology and uh, science in a school? I I had. Uh... Uh, in those days, I guess I had gold fever. Uh, I I had the inclination to get out there and find things, <laughs> and and uh, and having worked uh, through my university vacation periods um, with um, 
mineral and oil exploration companies. I, I, I got a liking for it. And, uh, and, and so I ended up paying off my teacher's college bond and, uh, and uh, disappearing into the, the world of exploration. Mm. I've always well, been in... I'm surprised you didn't... Uh, I'm surprised you didn't get lost in all, all, the, all the places you went to because it's a fairly extensive list of uh, places you've been and worked at. Um, some places I probably wouldn't like to go myself. Uh, but can you tell us... Uh, what sort of hardships are involved as well? Because obviously you have to camp out away from cities and stuff and stuff like that for long periods of time if you if you're doing exploration. Um, and I mean today there's there's a lot of things you know we, we have a lot of mods and cons that we can carry or take with us or you know. But I suspect in when you started off in in the early seventies and things like that, it would have been a bit of a different picture in regards to. Uh, the luxuries you could take out into the field. Well, certainly, yeah. It, in those days, it was uh, uh, it was swagging it, and uh, uh, and you had an esky, or, or if you're lucky, you had a car refrigerator and that sort of thing. But um, but the overseas work, it, it was generally living in little villages here and there. You know, um, like. Papua New Guinea, for example, I, I, I spent time, one of my uh, most memorable trips in Papua New Guinea was a, basically a 10 week walk from one village to the next, from one tribal area to the next, right up on the Urian Giant border at the time. And, and at, at one point found myself uh, when I realised where I was, <laughs> that I was actually in Indonesia, but uh, uh, but the the locals didn't recognise that. They said that this is our land. Yeah, so so those sort of incidents were uh, were quite common in, particularly in Papua New Guinea. And uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it was it, it was a difficult life. It was. It was it was hard on families. It was hard on hard on marriages, particularly um, the, the the life of exploration. You know, uh, when I was working through uh, the Mediterranean countries, um, I I was away at times up to ten weeks. You know, at, at a time, and then I'd come home for a couple of weeks and. Uh, and then head off again, and yeah, but there was there was substantial strain on on marriages. That's particularly uh, true. Yeah. On, on in regards to your field work, uh, what's your most memorable sort of eureka moment, or or that uh, or most rewarding um, bit of exploration? Well, a friend and I. Uh, in fact, you might might know of the friend, a fellow called Ian Plymer, Professor Ian Plymer. We together found uh, a pristine gold deposit in Greece that that at the uh, that after about ten million dollars of of exploration funding and drilling. Uh, was sitting at around about two million ounces of gold. So you, you you're talking at a couple of billion dollars worth of gold, uh, and then the Greek government, in their wisdom, decided that uh, they'd li listened to some Northern European environmentalists who said that there was a a rare snake that used to <laughs> nest in the area where our gold deposit had been found. And so they ended up cancelling our environmental authority. So basically, we couldn't do anything else and and had to walk away. Um, they then built a wind farm on top of the same area. <laughs> so so obviously, wind farms don't affect rare snakes. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> well yeah, you should have you should have you should have worked climate change somewhere into the exploration and how it was going to improve the improve the climate of the world or something. I mean, it, it's that's like every conversation you have these days uh, with any academics and that they somewhere along the line they weave climate change into into their topic. Well, it's it's got that way, yes, in the in the university systems that uh, to to obtain a grant you you really have to link it in some way to uh, to climate change if you're in the sciences mm. yeah um, we could go just... we could go on and on about that subject <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well i might get you and you and ian to come on and have a talk about geology and 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 what it tells us about climates of the past and what's likely of the future uh, but that's an, that's another topic. But I suppose mm. we should move on to the topic at hand. If you can give us a bit of an idea how you've ended up in Chile, go, um, considering you started off in New South Wales as a child and and you've travelled travelled all, all corners of the of the globe, um, Chile go is not exactly on on the on the big stage of uh, points to visit um, in regards to. Uh, being known, except for especially even for a lot of people in Australia, uh, and sometimes I wonder if people in Southeast Queensland even know it, know it exists. But if you can give us an idea why, how you've ended up in Chile, go, um, what the lifestyle is like, and what what beers they serve at the local pub, <laughs> and and then give us a, we'll just move on there to your adventures around the place on, and finding it. this site for the for a dam yeah. on the Walsh River. Yeah, I, I guess for about the first 20 years of my life, I was living in New South Wales. Um, uh, sorry, of my career, not my life. Um, <laughs> I was living in New South Wales uh, uh, and exploring a, a lot of the time around New South Wales, but also spending a lot of time up in Queensland. So, so I've been exploring up in this general North Queensland region um, for about 45 years. Um, uh, yeah, mid-70s is when I first moved, first started exploring up in the north here. Um, um, around, uh, what was it, 1991, 1992, actually, I I came up here to Chiligo to uh, to carry out a substantial contract for New Guinea Mining at the time, who who had bought the uh, the Red Dome Gold Mine and was and was going through an expansion process with the mine, and I came up here to to handle and manage uh, regional exploration to attempt to find other things in the district and uh, and uh, and miraculously i i was trapped in the spider web of love <laughs> um, i I I ended up marrying a a, a, a local lady and uh, and we settled down and, uh, uh, and and had a family. Um, I I had been previously married, so so I I'm a slow learner, um, basically. <laughs> um, I got to do got to do everything twice to try and work my way through things, but. So anyway, to cut a long story short, I moved up here in in um, 1992 and uh, oh sorry 1993 and and I've stayed hmm. and I I've uh, I, I guess because I grew up in small country towns I I took a liking to the place and uh, got to know a lot of the local people and fit into the local scene and. Get involved in the local progress association, and uh, for ten years I was the secretary of the local race club, and I was in the the uh, the local uh, 
rodeo committee and we and we used to bring entertainers up here to entertain us on the weekend we we had slim dusty come up here and my wife was a particular fan of slim dusties and we we brought 1500 people into town on the saturday night uh, over our races rodeo weekend yeah little things like that you know i just fitted into the town really mm. okay then um and so i'm still here <laughs> still here uh they'll have to carry you out um if you could if you can give us a bit of an idea why why or how did you come across the site on the Walsh River um, for a dam site? Was there a particular? Were you basically looking at uh, interest in water holdings or something like that, or what caught caught your imagination to to look for that, or did you just find the spot per first and say, "Well, that wouldn't be a bad site for a dam." Well, how it started was. Uh... I got involved in a fairly serious five-day bushwalk um, from the Chiligo side of the, the Featherbed Range to the Dimbula side, so a, 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 a trip of about uh, 50 kilometres, uh, walking up through the Walsh Gorge. And, uh, and, and while I was walking, I... I, I got thinking about dam sites that uh, I thought, you know, this this Walsh Gorge was a, a perfect dam site. You know, if, if you've got a deep incised valley um, that that uh, you you have a uh, uh, the the proportion of the width of your of your dam relative to your depth um, means that you've got a very low evaporation rate in a, in a deeply incised gully you know so um, so that was that was a big factor and I was you know when you when you're walking for five days you you've got a lot to think about on on those lines and and I'd, I'd seen the um, the intersection of um, uh, the confluence, I should say, of of of, uh, of a, a large creek system called Kumbella Creek, which flowed into the the Walsh Dam, and right at that site was what I looked at and said, "This is a perfect dam site." You know, um, uh, the the rocks, the, the the basement was was strong. The rocks were impermeable. Um, it had everything going for it, and and so I, I just uh, from there I went. Um, I happened to mention it in passing to uh, Senator Ian Macdonald, who had was passing through here a year or so later, and I, you know, he's he always had an interest in in northern Australian water, uh, as I have. And and I just happened to mention this to him, and I said, you know, that would be a perfect dam site, and you could you could turn all that country that is open range cattle grazing out on towards the Gulf into an irrigation scheme. And he said, oh, that's a good idea. Why don't you put a proposal to me? So so I I put the, put that little PowerPoint presentation together and. Sent it off to to Ian, and and he passed it on to the CSIRO, who uh, who obviously looked at it and considered it in their larger scale research program that they were doing all across Northern Australia, and uh, so so thankfully that uh, that site that I suggested ended up in their uh, research report. 
Uh, just before we move on to your little present PowerPoint presentation, I'll just show a screen of uh, the Australian mainland in particular and, and the rainfall characteristics. Up on the screen now, we've got uh, Australia's main sort of river systems and rainfall. Now, um, the northern Queensland basically is out flowing out to the Gulf, you've got about 26 uh, percent of the Australia's rainfall for going in, out into the, into the Gulf, and you've got about uh, 26 flowing out into the into the into the um, Pacific. So we're not short of water up up in North Queensland, uh, but we really don't do a, do a lot with it. And I think one of the most in, uh, interesting comparisons is. We all, all know and hear about the Murray-Darling Basin and its food production, although people want to seem to stop that by sending more water down to the uh, mouth of the Murray just to fly out to the sea. Uh, but the Murray-Darling only has about 6% of the total rainfall of Australia. So northern, northern Queensland basically dwarfs uh, the Murray-Darling in regards to potential for water usage. Too true, too true. Mm. Uh, and, and the thing is, we don't, we don't seem to be getting anywhere in the states of getting uh, new dams. Uh, we've had uh, up, in, up your way, there's, there was another proposal for the Nalinga Dam. Uh, that's been through, the, been through the process with the Queensland government and it's basically uh, supposedly didn't stack up uh, financially, but uh, one could worry about the criteria they use to do their cost-benefit analysis. Then we've had the, before the last election, we had a lot of conversations about the Bradfield Scheme and Hell's Gate Dam. Um, and after that, we had an assessment by, uh, on the Bradfield by, um, I think it was Professor uh, Galt and uh, Alan Dale from up, up here at JCU. And basically, there doesn't seem to be a lot of positive things coming out of, of, of their report for future use of water in, in uh, North Queensland because they think more water should flow, flow at, at the end of the river. So it's and not, not allowing for much to be um, available for our normal use. Unfortunately, our federal politicians uh, have blinkered vision. They, they, when they think of northern Queensland, they think, oh, water flowing out onto the reef and, <laughs> and killing the reef with mud and, and most of it's flowing towards the Gulf. It's just, it's just common sense, but, uh, Geography doesn't seem to be a, a big thing in Canberra. And, uh, uh, and unfortunately, you know, schemes like the, the, the CSIRO scheme that we've just been talking about, they, they, those reports sit for decades before anything gets done, and uh, if ever. Hmm. Yeah, actually, it was Ross Garner who actually chaired, chaired the assessment of the Brad. Bradfield scheme, um, so and nothing favourable came out of their assessment, but uh, that, that's what you would expect for someone who's led the climate change um, doomsday cult for some time. Uh, but I'll just put up your um, your uh, paper, uh, your presentation, and we'll just go through that. Good on. Mm. Okay, we've got got this the the header page up here. Um, so you up in the top left top left corner, we, this must be the area you your photograph that's the dam site. Yeah, that's pretty close to the dam site. That yeah, mm. but um, 
So, yeah, so go on when, because there's a there's a better photograph of it yeah, further on. So mm. so when when did you um, present this paper or uh, publish this paper? Uh, 2011 was when I sent it off to Ian McDonald. Hmm. Gee whiz, we're, we're talking Ian about McDonald. No, we're talking about 13 years. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. So you know, I made. I was making a series of points there that that about the site that you know it had potential to to develop uh, a totally new irrigation scheme that that would um, rival the the size of the irrigation schemes in the Murray Darling Basin and uh, and and potentially a, a pump pipeline back into the the, the Dimbula uh, orchard area, and I I figured it was a, a an ideal location in that the it's pretty wild country up through there, um, so it's not good grazing country. Um, it's it's part of Chiligo Station pastoral lease. But uh, but there are very few cattle up in in that uh, that area, and, and and that's a serious consideration these days. If you're if you're going to put a dam somewhere, you don't want to be drowning top quality land. agricultural land. Yeah, mm. and it's a fairly substantial dam. Then that's nine hundred meters long and sixty meters high because. That would sixty meters would be going close to the Vertican Falls Dam, I think. Yeah, but... it's about the same size. Mm. Okay, about, then. about the about the same size as the Vertican Weir. Yeah. Mm. But, okay. Um, but you know, as for my calculations of uh, of volume, well, I mean that's pretty. That was pretty rough and ready. It, I just did it. A sort of an average width and an average depth and and a length and and basically came up with a number but you know that that wasn't an accurate number it's just a, a bit of a guess really hmm. so your dam site sort of north uh east of chile northeast yeah yeah and and uh where dimbula is well that's somewhere around here is the the proposed and the linger dam that's never got off the ground either. Um, yeah, so, that's right. It's up. It's up the top end of the Walsh of the yeah, yeah. Of the same river. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So, in fact, if if both of <laughs> if both were were um, put in place, you could actually have one dam keeping this uh, uh, level fairly constant, but to uh, to the other dam. Um, and let's face it, permanent water brings life to everything. So uh, I I don't know why people have got such resistance to dam because add wa water, you seem to add life. Yeah, well, you know, I've seen I've seen the Walsh River just outside of Chiligo, uh, flowing at about a ten metre depth. It's it really rages in the middle of the wet season and. Uh, and all that water is just going out into the Mitchell and then into the Gulf. And uh, if if it was controlled and uh, and let out at a constant rate, uh, there's potential irrigation scheme that you're just showing now. Oh, well, not only the that. Size is by, by having it controlled, rather than have this bust and dust sort of thing, we, we Queensland has this wild rivers um, legislation and that, but it doesn't really make sense to, we have very, uh, our wet season probably runs about three months and, and it's pretty variable. Sometimes we're lucky enough to get uh, good after effects from a cyclone and give us a good dumping, but other times it's, it's sort of just you know, could be below average, but as the, as it goes without dams, we just have this long period, basically just dry creek beds uh, for for about six months of the year. 
which does no one or no no one or no thing any good in regards to our wildlife or anything like that. Yeah, well, that that area that I've I've outlined on that slide, you know, you go out there towards the end of the dry season, and it's uh, it's semi desert basically. <laughs> yeah, it's but very with what, but with very water, that, that soil that soil is fairly uh, would be productive. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got the 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 Carpentarian Basin it is the basic geology out there, and uh, and it's a a sand sand um, shale siltstone basin um, that produces a, 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 quite a good soil all the way, hmm. okay. and and I think that's one of the points that. That Syro made in their report is that that you know it is there's favourable country out there for irrigation. Okay. Basically, this is this is this uh, uh, structure of the local uh, geology and that uh, featherbed range. So obviously, yeah. this this is why it it. it it should support a, a good dam. Yeah, well, that's right. So, yeah, as I was saying before, it's a, it's it's a, a pretty barren patch of country. The uh, the the new the featherbed range, the uh, uh, scrappy, scrubby country with very little soil development, uh, practically no stock graze it. Um, it's it's not really the sort of country that you'd you'd think of putting a national park on either, <laughs> um, you know it's it's it really is an ideal spot to put a put a big water reservoir. Mm. Oh well, as long as, you, long as we're not sort of endangering some unknown piece of wildlife that has we haven't found yet. Uh, did did you oh, come yeah, up well, so that... much much native? Uh, native wildlife out there. Well, well, I was keeping my eye open for bunyips, but <laughs> uh, didn't didn't find any. But uh, okay. okay, we'll just just go. Yeah, there's plenty of plenty of wallabies up in there. Mm -hmm. Oh well, the thing is that they'd appreciate constant water to to drink and breed with. Uh, but. Uh, they're they're not in danger of uh, drowning from a dam because it fills up slowly and and they've got and they can always hop away. <laughs> oh, they they'd thrive on it. It, it would give them uh, you know permanent water all the way down um, that uh, river system. So this this diagram here would be the uh, flood flood area of the dam. Yeah, basically, I just drew. Uh, the I, dam, I, dams, dams here. Put 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 the dam there, and and uh, and I said, well, let's make it um, sixty meters deep, and then and then I ran a, I took a topographic map, and uh, and and ran a pencil line around the contour um, of sixty meters above the the uh, river level at that point, and. And that's the shape that I ended up with. And so it meets the criteria of a fairly narrow um, water uh, course uh, with, with a significant depth. So you, you minimise the uh, surface area for evaporation. Yes, that's right. Mm. Uh, so and this photo... Right up to the top... Right up that north, yeah. Well, that, that photos, that's that's about the dam site there, um, right in front of you in the four, basically in the middle ground there. Yeah, from but, there uh, to the, across there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, basically that 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 was it. Yeah. Mm. So, so between the the riverbed there <laughs> to the top, you'll get you'll get sixty meters. Oh, hi. Oh, yeah. Yeah, easy. Yeah. Okay, then. 
and this is obviously tracking out there. And this gives you an indication of the of the rock base that, that, that's around the, the waterway. This is what you're saying is impervious stone. Yeah, well, there there is my my crew of bushwalkers doing, doing our five day bushwalk, um, with me in front for a change. Mm. Instead of being dragged along. <laughs> See that bloke there in the front? Yep. He at the he at the time was in his early seventies. And he was the fittest of a lot of us. <laughs> well, there you go. Hmm. So this is a sort of another view of the overall uh landscape. Yes, very favorable and and you can see the the rocks there are really solid rocks. They're they're very silica rich and and lack permeability, so it's 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 perfect for uh, uh, the base for a dam site. Hmm. So there's yeah. there's the dam site, and we'll, the the next image basically shows where I would put the dam. And there, there I've drawn the sixty meter high wall, wall for basically for for a weir, uh, with the spillway off off to the the, the right hand side there, and so, and the power station, the hyd hydroelectric power station there uh, in 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 the red you can see. Mm. Uh, trouble is, you're a bit away from the transmission lines, wouldn't you be? <laughs> oh, about um, 25 k's. But it would only be uh, less than 100 megs or megawatt uh, hydro. Don't talk to me about uh, electricity. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then no worries. Uh, we'll move on. So th this is obviously yours on a contour map with the with the outlines. Yeah. So there's uh, the original before. topographic map that I yeah. I used to define the, the boundaries to the storage or the the high level, the highest level of the storage. Yeah. Okay. And that's it filled in with water one day, hopefully. <laughs> And I presume we can also out of out of these dams, we can also get amenity, not just water. I mean, that that's one of the things a lot of people don't uh, sort of get the gist of uh, with dams. Um, they can they can attract tourists. They can uh, there's all there's also recreational use provided you can keep the keep some uh, water level in there. Um, so there's there's a lot of advantages to dam besides just the uh, the sheer using of water for for drinking and irrigation. Mm. Yeah, fair enough. You you could put a little little wharf there and serve pina coladas and yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah the mind, you might even throw the a mind bit boggles. Of fish in it. Mind boggles. Mm. What you can do. So so I had to get some geology in. So, so there's there's the the geology. It's basically flat lying, um, what we call um, welded ash flow tuffs, which are basically the the sorts of rocks that erupted from places like Mount Vesuvius and buried Pompeii and places like that, except that they're Highly welded, they're very silica rich and impermeable. Okay. Uh, so and, 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 and just to draw, hmm, just draw draw a comparison with the Burdekin Dam situation. The the Burdekin Dam has almost identical geology. Well, that's that's sort of interesting because I think one of the uh, issues of that's been raised with the increasing the Burdekin Dam wall to its a uh, full stage two height, an extra fourteen point uh, six six meters. 
because uh, this is the ama amazing part. People back in the 80s actually planned it, planned ahead and allowed for expansion and allowed for uh, as North Queensland developed, that dam could be increased in size by another 14 odd metres with a spillway. Um, but some of the uh, detractors from the plan suggest that the footings on the Burdekin Dam uh, wouldn't support the extra height and the and hold and load of the full 14 metres. But I find that difficult. I'm not. I'm not one to argue. Yeah, well, it, it, well, I I do know. I I go across that um, that causeway quite often. I've got mining leases down to the south of the Bertigan Dam, and uh, so I go across there often. And and over over the the last ten years or so, they've been drilling a. a a series of holes investigating the foundations, etc. So they're they're obviously looking seriously at you know what what the foundations are like um, and whether or not the the dam would uh, would hold up under under the additional stress. But um, but who knows? I don't know anything about that. Okay then. Um... This is just the wrap up of, of the dam in regards to uh, you've got it as a uh, potential size of about, uh, I think you've got here 1.6 million gigalit uh, megalitres, which is 1.6 gigalitres, is it? Uh, yes, yes. That's the, that's the normal sort of, they measure most of the dams in, in gigalitres as far as the major ones going. Um, so it's it's reasonably substantial. It uh, you're talking, it, what, talking what, like what, what other dams are, are in comparison to uh, about that volume? Because I know things like the Lake Argyle Dam, and that's you know <laughs> that's about eleven or twelve gigalitres or something like that. It's huge. But um, yeah, how does it compare yeah. to the um, say the Burdekin or, or other dams we know of, uh, might know around the place? It it'll be it it'll be about half the Burdekin size. Um, uh, it's about three times the size of Tinaru, say. Three times the storage area of Tinaru, I should say. Mm. Okay, so it's that equipped to mitigate wet sleaze and flooding, and and also have a bit of. So it's got a bit of. Uh, it's not only just storage; it has it has a capability to provide some mitigation uh, during during the, uh, major rainfall events and potential for hydroelectricity. Mm. Okay, I'll I'll just bring up um, something here from the CSRO um, episode. Right. I'll just just bring up the uh, CSRO um, uh, assessment for uh, your Walsh River Dam. So it it it, it was first in the listing. Their paper um, included um, some thirteen dam sites. Uh, some already exist and were looking at in regards to uh, upgrade. <coughs> So th this is this is uh, the one on the on your catchment now on the Walsh. So they've drawn their little sketch there, and I presume they've overlaid it on your original drawing <laughs> or, or photos. Well, they've taken a slightly different uh, angle with the uh, uh, with the satellite imagery there. Mm. Yeah. 
but it's a yeah. similar location. But, but yeah, they've, they've they've done a good job of of that. Yeah. Mm. Okay then. Um, now we get into. But it doesn't. It doesn't look to me like they've they've got it as high as as. No, that's that's as, where I, that I was just coming to. Um, mm. You you've got you can get it up to sixty meters and hold one point six gigalitres. Now, looking at well, their their assessment, they don't they, they don't give you too too much. But what they do give you is the capital cost of water per megalitre, and they've got it as uh, two hundred two thousand and fifty two dollars per megalitre. Um, for the capital cost. And what they're saying is the capital cost is over a billion dollars. And if you divide the 2000 into the uh, um, billion odd dollars, it only comes up with about 522 mega, megalitres, which is a third of your assessment. Um, so it's quite worrying that they've made their evaluation and and assessment, and it makes it look like, um, well, the price of water is still fairly high at two thousand dollars. It's not a not a cheap water dam, uh, but the difference is they're only only allowing for a third of the volume. Uh, yes, if you went to the sixty meter wall, that's going to add to the cost, um, but overall, you, they that water cost could come down to. You know, half, half of the uh, megalitre uh, cost from two thousand to to one thousand dollars, which makes it a, a lot more uh, palatable. Yeah, I, I could make several points. One is, well, the first point is that that my calculation of volume was pretty rough and ready. It was a just a a, a, a very simple arithmetic. Uh, uh, of uh, height, uh, average, average depth, average width, and length. Now they've obviously gone to a lot, lot more trouble to to do their calculation of the storage volume, but it, but it, but does it say there how high their dam is? No, no this is this is what I'm saying. Um... It's, because it looks the, to me like like they they've got a fairly small dam and and that's that's what hmm. I'm saying in regards to a lot of a lot of things that government departments do uh, often don't make things look favorable and to me looking at their data here there's no mention of the height of the height of the wall um, and so if if their height is only say, 30 metres, well, then, you know, it's not, it's, it's losing a lot of potential. So, so this is the, this is the problem. And if you go through, I mean, there's 13 dams here, um, and including the Ningaland, which is, is, is the next one down. Um, and they're running their costs on that thing at $5,000 per megalitre. I mean, no farmer is going to be able to afford water at $5,000 a megalitre. Uh, and be really profitable. So sometimes you wonder uh, whether they do uh, or provide enough information and how how they come to these results. And because this, this, the the results decided by or put out there by CSRO are going to be taken by the bureaucrats and the politicians in the first instance to say yay or nay. So sometimes when we're not getting a fair go in regards to what the potentials are of these sites. <clears throat> yeah, fair enough. The, there's not enough information there to... to see, see I, I would see from a person, like you've put that proposal in, uh, the first thing I'd want to know is that you know, you've come up with, although your uh, estimate was rough in regards to water volume, uh, it's 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 reasonable mathematical uh, variation that you you can you know, it, it's acceptable sort of level within within some error, but they're put in their assessment 
it doesn't make it look as good for, of course, the volume so low. But there again, you don't know what height they set the wall at and why they set the uh, wall height at that. Uh, is it to make it unfavorable or that? So um, I, I, that's where um, they should be more reasonable and give more detail of you know the possibility of minimum, minimum, maximum wall height or something like that that they're prepared to sort of put up as a project. So, um, so that that would be concerning for people like yourself who who put in submissions that they don't you know, either come back and get information or or they go off on a slightly different tangent or or they don't really want it to be have a favourable outcome for us assessment. Yeah, well, you know, I have to say that I've not taken much interest since I, <laughs> since I. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot, a lot of time, in, a I lot just, of times. I just thought it, it, it was a throwaway report. I've got a lot of other things to do in my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but there again, I mean, it did make it into their assessment, and I know it does have potential, and we probably needed to ha need them to have a look at it again, but that. That, that moves me to the sort of final area we, we should talk about in regards to, I mentioned that uh, Northern Queensland has about nearly 50% of Australia's rainfall uh, in both its catchments to the east and the west, um, into the Gulf and into the Pacific Ocean uh, that we can harvest. We've had little tamperings and talks about the Bradfield scheme um, but do you, do you think we've we've really done it justice in regards to the whole water systems of, of northern Australia and uh, North Queensland in particular? Because the Bradfield scheme never came up and included anything like the Gilbert River, the Flinders River, the Mitchell River, and the Mitchell River is uh, probably the uh, most voluminous uh, water flow uh, in North Queensland or I mean, Queensland, far as river systems go. Well, you talk about the the Flinders. I I did a little exercise on a on a site in the Upper Flinders where you could build a weir, a serious weir, and a twenty kilometre canal into the top end of basically what becomes the Thompson River. And the whole thing would flow um, without having to build any tunnels whatsoever. So, you know, the, these sorts of things are, are, are quite on the cards as far as I'm concerned. The, uh, I mean, the, the Bradfield scheme all of those those rivers all flow into the centre, basically into in towards the Lake Eyre Basin and uh, uh, you know like the Paru and the Diamantina and all of those, but the the uh, and the Thompson, um, but but there's a hell of a lot of country in there that in within Queensland that could be irrigated. If you were to divert a river like the Flinders, which has a huge flow of water going out each year into the Gulf, hmm. I think the problem is um, Brisbane doesn't seem to have the interest in uh, north northern Queensland and de and developments you know, such as irrigation. It seems to always be a major hurdle for. Um, communities <laughs> to even get drinking water, let alone irrigation water. But you know uh, that that's a battle to be fought by other people. Yeah, yeah. Um, just before we wind up, we've just gone on the hour. Um, what do you think we need in regards to uh, getting the conversation back uh, for northern northern Queensland communities? To make them more prosperous and 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 ensure their future, uh, because we do seem to have a situation where there's almost a little a bit of wilting of a lot of uh, uh, 
rural and, and remote communities and that. Um, in regards to Chiligo, what do you think Chiligo needs to sort of make sure it stays on the map and, and grows? Well, mineral development for starters, um, you know, there, there's, there are still substantial resources here. Uh, they just have to be exploited in the correct manner, not like the, the last few exercises. Um, but um, but but things like this the this potential irrigation scheme on on the Walsh and Mitchell. Um, if if you had those and had them linked by proper roading and 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 towns, they they an irrigation scheme like that could could support an economy. Um, like the Aboriginal communities, Pomparau, etc., could uh, could greatly benefit from such an irrigation scheme. There would be lots of employment for them, and uh, uh, and and lots of export earnings from from this area. You know, I, I see it in that sense that um, um, that the you know, the Aboriginal communities could greatly benefit from a, an irrigation scheme on the Mitchell, the lower Mitchell. We've, we've had some success with uh, agriculture uh, in North, North Queensland, in, in new sites um, uh, near Cohen and that, uh, and there's been talk about uh, the need to uh, dam a little, uh, the Palmer River uh, so those sort of things, they're not what we're, we're not asking for big snowy river schemes or anything like that, but just sensible size uh, dams that can support agriculture and, and help develop more communities uh, and uh, economic growth here. Certainly, yes, yep. And uh, yeah, and, and, and this proposal is, is one of them. And 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 as I mentioned, the that the, that Flinders River site as well that could be looked into, and uh, you know that could create a a, um, a very large irrigation scheme up in the Upper Thompson area. Well, I think at the moment there is an attempt to get the Hume's and um, uh, uh, irrigation project up too. I mean. It sort of looked like it was a bit of a goer, but then uh, it's it's been sort of mm, run into a bit of an issue uh, and, uh, from lack of support from the government, but hopefully they can push their way through and get that irrigation project. But, but the thing is, the systems we've got lend themselves to um, numerous small um, pockets of... of uh, water storage we don't have don't have to have one big th thing like the hume dam or anything like that uh, the landscape lends itself to um uh smaller uh strategic um dam sites like your like the one you've just shown us certainly yeah well you know when you think about the snowy scheme the, there there are a whole series of those dams that uh, you know, and some of them are not very large. You know, Talbingo, for example, is not a not a huge dam, nor is Blowering. And um, um, yeah, the the but combined, the the cumulative effect is 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 overwhelming to uh, produce a very large irrigation scheme down downstream. Okay, then um, we'll just wind it up here. Um, if you just want to finish up on any notes in regards to um, your hopes or, and expectations for that dam site and Chiligo itself. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very much involved in, 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 in the local mineral scene here, of course, but um, 
uh, and and this dam site is was basically a throwaway story that uh, that yes uh, it took my interest and uh, and certainly I'd like to see it progress yeah okay then um if if we'll just leave it there uh, if you just stay on the line I'll just introduce it uh, the next show and I'll have a talk to you off air. Good day. Thanks for your time, John. If you enjoyed tonight's show, please like, share and subscribe to our Facebook chat page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, I'll be back tomorrow night and we'll have another episode on our current series, extra series of the Cairns Council elections. And we'll be talking to independent candidates from Division 5, which covers the CBD area of Cairns. So please join me tomorrow night. Thank you.